Hi everyone, it's Gina McDonald here from FNA. Just popping on to say hello, good morning. Uh, we're gonna give, um, say about another minute, 90 seconds or so to have everyone join our webinar and get connected and then we'll begin. So see you in about a minute to 90 seconds. Thanks. Hi everyone, Gina McDonald here from FMA. Welcome uh, to Financial Scenario Planning in a Changing Environment. Uh, wanted to um, welcome also uh, our friends and um, I wanna say friends and sponsors, but sponsors just doesn't seem <laughs> like the right word for our close partners um, from the Hartford Foundation this morning as well. Uh, so, I uh, also wanted to turn it over to Mayor uh, to kind of kick us off this morning. Thanks, Gina. Um, so, good morning and welcome everyone. This is Mayor Shulman with the Hartford Foundation's Nonprofit Support Program. Um, great to have everyone with us today. We have um, had about uh, over 100 folks registered for today's webinar. Um, and joining me today are um, the NSP team. Uh, I think our director, Melanie Tavares, may be joining a little later, um, Amy Steadwell, our senior officer, and our wonderful support team of um, Betsy Johnson and Monica Kelly. And just a special thanks to, to Betsy for all of her behind the scenes assistance in uh, managing the um, logistics for today's session. Um, we're happy to offer this webinar free of charge. Um, and the only thing we ask in return is that you please complete the survey that you'll receive uh, immediately following the webinar. And as always, we really value your thoughts on the session and your suggestions on what other programs you're interested in having us offer in the coming months. Um, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, um, who may look familiar to you as she's done a number of workshops on financial management for us in the past and is definitely uh, backed by popular demand. Um, so Gina McDonald is a CPA and lead consultant with FMA. Um, she, Gina works closely with a wide variety of nonprofits to help them build their internal capacity, uh, both through one-on-one -on -one consultations as well as through trainings like this one. And uh, prior to joining FMA, Gina spent 17 years in public accounting, including 10 years in nonprofit and governmental accounting, where much 
her work was focused on helping board members and staff leaders to understand their financial results and to use that data to make good decisions. Um, Gina has also served on the boards of many nonprofits, often as a treasurer. Um, and that's all I have. And with that, I will turn the program over to you, Gina. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, also, I think it's fun when we're on Zoom in this way to let folks know, you know, where are we all calling in from? So just to let you all know, I'm chatting with you today uh, from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and also wanted to let folks know that I'm joined um, by my FNA colleague, Radhika Shah, and Radhika is in uh, New York City. So um, before we jump in, Radhika is going to help to orient us to a couple of Zoom control features. Hi, everyone, and good morning. Um, so I'm sure many of you have been on Zoom already <laughs> in the past few months. So I just wanted to let you know, we are only going to be using the Q&A function for any questions and comments. The chat function right now is disabled. So if you have any questions, comments, you can enter them directly through the Q&A box. You have the option to ask any of your questions anonymously if you prefer. You'll also be able to view all questions as they come in. So if you see someone that has a question similar to yours, you can choose to upvote it. You can also comment on a question to add some clarity in case there's a little bit of confusion. And we're gonna in, feel free to ask your questions throughout the webinar because we're going to take quite a few breaks throughout to answer questions. Um, I also, I know that there were a couple of questions that came in about the audio. Um, if for some reason you're having trouble with your audio and hearing, I recommend that you try to join audio by phone. If you click on your, on your bottom Zoom panel on your, your phone icon, there's a little carrot. And if you click that, you have the option to join by phone. Um, there'll be a couple of different phone numbers that you can choose to dial into. And then you enter your meeting ID. And that is sometimes a much easier and better way to join by audio because internet audio can sometimes be a little iffy. So if you're having some trouble with audio, please try to join by phone instead. Great, thanks Radhika. And we're gonna see and hear from Radhika again. She's gonna really um, help us to facilitate our Q&A and also be monitoring um, what folks are writing into that um, Q&A feature as well. So before we jump into our content, you know, if we were able to be together in person, we might have a show of hands around the room just to understand well, who is in our workshop this morning. So we'd like to do something similar and launch a poll and find out, you know, who's in our virtual training room today. Um, so you should see the poll right now up on your screen. Um, we'll give everyone a minute or so to respond and we'll share out the results as to who's with us this morning. Um, we've got a number of program staff with us, which is great to see. And of course, uh, fundraising staff as well. This is gonna be really important as we uh, talk through scenario planning this morning. We're gonna talk about, well, who could be involved in the scenario planning process? We're gonna see that it's nice we have a variety of folks in different roles with us today, because certainly lots of folks cross-functionally will play a role in this kind of financial planning. So there's also uh, another reason besides, of course, great interest in you know, who's joining us this morning as to understand, gee, you know, there is some linkage between your role and what you might play in terms of scenario planning. So let's see, we've got, you know, so less than half finance staff, which again, this is really a great showing because uh, it's not just the person who is the accountant or a bookkeeper or CFO, director of finance, who's going to participate in scenario planning. So we've got consultants, number of program staff and fundraising staff as well. So this is really great news. So 
that's who's with us today. In terms of your experience with scenario planning, we're gonna launch another poll, which you should see right now on your screen. Kind of wondering, as you're coming to our session this morning, what's been your experience so far? Because we're gonna spend some time reviewing a scenario planning framework. And some of us might be here saying, well, I've done this lots of times, not only in this really changing environment, but I've done scenario planning for other reasons. And certainly we may have had other reasons you know, to wanna to think about different financial models but maybe we're here to learn some new tips, tricks. We might wanna hear what kinds of questions and experiences others have as well. Um, so take a moment um, and let us know what your experience has been. Um, in a few seconds, we'll close the poll and share out results and see what we can share with you in terms of our experience around scenario planning. So lots of us have some experience and would like to get more experience. And so that's really most of us here this morning. So we've done some of it. It'd be great to maybe look at a new framework, do this a little bit more. And some of us, of course, are new to scenario planning in general. The good news is we're gonna have lots of opportunity to be doing scenario planning, say in the upcoming months. And the more you practice this, the more you work through the process, the better you get at it, right? So we're also gonna talk about building your planning muscle. So seems like we're all in the right place and interested in thinking about scenario planning. So let's just jump into it, also setting a little bit of context. Because we at FNA talk about financial resilience or financially resilient organizations all the time. It seems really relevant, of course, in this moment that we're seeking to be resilient in this changing environment. But really, what is the definition of a financially resilient organization and why are we bringing it up when we're talking about scenario planning? Well, Financially resilient organizations look to the future. So stay focused on the long term. But also there's this aspect of assessing and responding to your current needs. Today, however, long term seems like a different time horizon. So that's what we also want to think about in scenario planning is what is the time horizon it might be different than it was during more typical times. Lots of us used to want to put together long-term plans, three-year plans, five-year plans. That seems maybe like a luxury now because we can't see that far into the future. So it's really also defining, well, what does long-term mean right now? It could mean three months from now, six months from now might seem like a luxury, but it's really looking as far ahead as we can but then also monitoring and assessing what's going on right now, it also helps to revise and inform those plans. So really we can still look to the same definition of what it means to be a financially resilient organization. The difference is though, that our financial planning will just take this different form. So many of us likely have an idea of what our planning looks like in typical times. When we think about financial planning, we might think of our one year annual budget. We might think about that long term plan we just alluded to. We might think about maybe we had a strategic plan that had a budget that went with that plan. But we're really accustomed to lots of different kinds of financial planning. All financial planning has certain attributes. And really, when we think about, well, what is financial planning? We want to think about the process. It's a process to define how an organization's strategy will be funded. 
So really we always start with the activities. What activities are we going to conduct? Again, it's influenced by that time frame. When we would put together our one year annual budget, we were thinking about, well, what are the activities I want to conduct in the next year? We might have a different time horizon now. And also we may be unsure as to what are viable options for me right now. So this is the trick with the changing environment is that in normal times, we might have felt like we had some potential control over what activities we chose to conduct or not. And now it's a changing environment. We have this uncertainty, this risk that's layered upon, you know, any kind of decision or avenue we want to choose. And so either way though, we're going to try and narrow down our options this morning. In this world of potential uncertainty, how do I figure out what are my viable options so I can inform this strategy and then I start to price out my strategy. However, the fact that we're operating in this changing environment doesn't mean that our planning process becomes obsolete. All of these same concepts hold true even in our scenario planning. So even in typical times, ideally our budgeting, our financial planning process is ongoing. So we know that it's an iterative process. But then who's going to participate in that budgeting process? It's team-based, right? So it's a team-based ongoing process. Different folks in the organization participating in financial planning. There may be some kind of an inclination right now maybe to not include folks in the process. Maybe you might say, well, it's stressing people out. Or you might want to protect or shelter folks from this environment of uncertainty. You know, we're hearing and we're observing, of course, that folks still want to participate in this process, still want to be aware and have information. So if your process prior you know, to the crisis included different folks participating in your budget process, you may want to consider having representation still from those different departments or different functions in the scenario planning process. Right? So may not be the time to exclude folks, might actually be the time to have more transparency about the decisions we're having to make right now. And of course, we want to think about, even in our scenario planning moment, even in this environment of uncertainty, we're focusing on whatever the future means for us, whatever that time horizon is, where we're going to monitor and stay responsive to the present. We're going to need to structure our scenario planning models to allow for this pretty efficient course correction, recalibration, where it always was important for our budgets to be flexible because unless we have some kind of a crystal ball, we're guessing also when we put our budgets together, but it seems more important now that these plans be flexible. We need to be able to pivot. We need to be able to change the plan in particular when we're dealing with all of these external factors right, that are going to influence what activities we can conduct or not. So it's really, again, same concepts around financial planning, thinking about resiliency, and just looking to see, well, what does it look like now compared to what it looked like in the past? The budget, however, as we mentioned, always did have some implication of, you know, maybe we had some control or influence for our path ahead. Now we find ourselves in a different mode. So if we think about what does the budget look like, how does it compare to what we're going to review today as a scenario plan? The annual budget, of course, had a different time horizon, which we've talked about. Your scenario plan 
could be a shorter term, could be a longer term. You may also change the duration and length of your scenario plans as time goes on. So there's something different around the time horizon of your scenario planning. The budget, of course, is typically more detailed. Your one-year annual budget is typically more detailed than a scenario plan. We know all of the work we do around documenting assumptions, really granular information in our one-year annual budgets. Our scenario plans, if we think about the fact that they need to be really flexible just by the nature of our changing environment. We need to be able to efficiently course correct, change, modify. Then our scenario plan is not going to be at the same detailed level. It's going to be a higher level projection than our annual budget. We're going to think about key revenue and expense drivers we're going to see. And of course, the budget was used as a way to prioritize available resources, manage performance. Scenario plan will still do that, right? If we have resources available, our scenario plan will be the way we're evidencing how we are prioritizing resources. Scenario plan may be the way we kind of let folks know what activities we're prioritizing, what's important to us, this is what we're choosing to do, but it also has this element of informing decisions. So it's a little bit more of a tool to provide data to actually make quick decisions. So lots of us know that we have potentially lots of decisions to make right now. This tool could also help to communicate our plans and to inform our decisions. So it's also about making data-driven decisions. We also want to mention that not all scenario planning happens in this context of a crisis. And for those of us who responded that, you know, we have lots of experience in scenario planning, we may have had opportunities to do scenario planning in, say, times of growth, positive change, things of that nature. And so certainly we want to understand that this framework is valuable not just for situations um, like you're experiencing right now, but we could use this all the time. So then what does the scenario planning framework look like? How might it be different than our one year annual budget? Well, not surprising uh, for, and I know you're seeing a blank screen, but not surprising um, if anyone's ever uh, chatted with us at, at FNA about budgeting and planning before, we're not going to jump into a spreadsheet and start inputting numbers. Right? We need to figure out our plan first. So thinking about the process is important. Again, why is thinking about the process of scenario planning important? Because we're going to have to repeat it often in this changing environment. So we've got to get good at the process be efficient, build our planning muscle. But we explain scenario planning as a three-step approach. First, we're gonna start with understanding our current financial position. It's our baseline. Where are we right now? And looking at some different things in terms of the baseline is helpful in scenario planning. We're going to touch upon that briefly, but we're going to spend most of our time identifying implications and thinking about the scenarios. This is where we're going to spend most of our time today in step two. We're going to see what viable options exist for us. How do I narrow down those options and build out the scenarios? And then finally, we're going to be able to understand, well, what's the best way to monitor what is happening in reality? as compared to those plans. But certainly, this process is not linear. So we may end up having to go through this and kind of go back to the drawing board a couple of times, as we mentioned. Right? And so when we think about, again, our typical planning, it may not look this way. We typically do not build out you know, several versions of our budget or several models, things of that nature. So that's why this looks a little bit different. Okay. 
So then in terms of that step one, the understanding the baseline, where are we now? Let's just briefly touch upon that and figure out, well, what are the key components in terms of where I'm starting from a financial position that I need to understand before we can kind of call through um, maybe all of the universe of options that seems to be available to us and narrow down to viable options for my organization. Well, when we think about understanding our financial position, we might want to understand something about our available resources at a certain moment in time. You know, we want to know, well, what are we working with? Where is our starting place? And of course, we see that in the balance sheet. So just as a reminder, balance sheet tells us information about what we own. So it's all of our assets which include things like, of course, our cash. Now, these are resources we already have. Cash, accounts receivable, pledges receivable, grants receivable, maybe investments, we might have fixed assets, things of that nature. Everybody we owe. So all of our liabilities at a moment in time, what bills are due, do we owe any um, dollars on our lines of credit, have we received any revenue in advance? Do we have deferred revenue? Do we have refundable advances? Any other kind of debt? And then of course, and then of course, the difference between what we own and what we owe is our net assets or our net worth. And so when we think about, well, what are the critical questions here in scenario planning that I need to ask when I look at my balance sheet or statement of financial position? It's gonna be a lot focused on net assets, net worth. We wanna know not only the resources available to us right now, because this is what we already have, but what of those resources is in flexible form? Because if I'm trying to make choices here as to my course of action, do I have to go get new resources? Do I already have resources for those activities and so forth? So in terms of what kinds of questions we may want to ask ourselves, you know, we've got to remember, well, the balance sheet is a cumulative snapshot in time, but it is the place where we're going to be able to answer those questions about liquidity. What do we have in terms of debt? Do we have any available reserves? And then furthermore, laying on top of those responses, we need to answer the question about what is the financial flexibility that is evidenced on my balance sheet? In particular, the critical questions may sound something like this. Perhaps I'm an organization that when I look at my balance sheet and look at my net assets, I may have net assets without donor restrictions. So really typically, this is net worth, this is equity, if you will, that's kind of free and clear, right? The organization has flexibility to direct those resources where they, where, you know, the board leadership sees fit. But do I have board designated funds? So has the governing body, has the board set aside some of my resources? If so, we want to ask ourselves in preparation for scenario planning, well, what are the limitations on those resources? What was the purpose of that board designated fund? Would the board be willing to redirect or release, if you will, some of those dollars that are earmarked if necessary? Right? So. Again, these might be a little bit of different questions in the scenario planning moment. In typical budgeting, you may not need to ask these questions. Right? So again, it's kind of taking inventory, taking stock of what we have available before we start to think about our options. We might want to put our numbers in context of some ratios like Luna, for instance. So perhaps besides my board designated funds, it would be helpful to know what of my net worth or what of my net assets 
is in liquid form. So maybe my balance sheet looks extremely healthy, robust, lots of assets, not a lot of liabilities, but maybe my net worth is not in spendable form. Maybe my net worth is invested in things like buildings and land and vehicles and things we can't pay the bills with, right? Or things I couldn't fund my scenario plan with. So how much of our reserves are liquid? And then based on the dollar amount of the liquid reserves, how many months will that last me? And so these are some of the things, some of the background information that we wanna understand about our baseline before we move forward. Then in terms of our net assets with donor restrictions, right, lots of us are looking at, you know, in this moment, what kinds of resources do we have on hand that has an external donor restriction, either for time or purpose? If so, are we still able to satisfy those donor restrictions? We need to know, of course, if there's opportunity for us to continue to satisfy those donor restrictions. We also need to ask ourselves the questions and have conversations with funders, all sorts of donors around the fact that if I'm not able to conduct certain activities anymore and I cannot meet these external restrictions, is there opportunity to use these dollars in a different way? And of course, we would need permission to do so, but we need to know what our inventory is, right? We need to know the nature and dollar amount of all of those restrictions before we jump in. And then of course, finally, some of us have things like endowments. We're looking at market value, things of that nature. Again, looking at all our resources and figuring out what's available. So at this moment, it'd be great to kind of hear from all of you in terms of this first step in scenario planning, a little bit taking our inventory, taking stock of our financial flexibility or what we have in terms of financial position in order to inform our scenario planning. How for folks who've done scenario planning, how has your understanding of your financial position helped you plan? Right? So what have you all observed in real life you know, in preparation for scenario planning that you found helpful? Or, you know, do some of us find ourselves in a situation where we say, well, I'm not really sure um, what our financial position is, because sometimes it's kind of hard to weave through all of the information on our balance sheet. So what has been your experience in this first step of scenario planning? So if you just want to take a moment, let us know if, looking at your financial position is really helping you with funding requests and telling your financial story or helping you to know what your operating runway is maybe it's helpful to understand how long our resources will last us or maybe we're not sure yet our financial position is unclear so let us know how it's going for all of you in step one here so, so far, no one's unsure, um, or a couple of folks are unsure. Lots of us are in this kind of second category that looking at the financial position helps us to know how long our resources will last, right? And certainly that's what we see. So this is a really important context, right? So think about typical budgeting or think about long-term planning, or maybe putting together a grant budget, you may not need this framing. In scenario planning, this is really important framing. Knowing how long our runway is, is more important than ever, because we may have to put together some really serious contingency plans, things of that nature. So certainly knowing how long we can survive you know, based on resources we already have in hand is a critical component. So thanks everyone for that. Just wanted to check in before we move to talking about phase two 
of scenario planning, where we're going to spend most of our time, you know, thinking through scenarios, things of that nature. Um, if anyone has any questions that have either come through the Q&A or uh, we'll take a few minutes uh, to have a quick discussion or a question break, if anything's coming up for folks based on what we've talked about so far. Sure. Um, so I think one of the big questions that's come up is, and maybe you're going to cover this a little bit later in the webinar, but what folks are looking for insight on the shift that's happening on the revenue side from shifting from in person to online, maybe reductions in donation. Um, this organization has tried to shift their, their strategies, but there are so many different variables that, you know, they're coming across. So any insights that we might be able to provide on, on what happens on the revenue side? Yep, that's a great both question and observation. And certainly this isn't, it's not even unusual that, you know, once we start talking about any kind of planning and budgeting, we always want to start to talk about, you know, well, what are the activities we want to conduct? Soon thereafter, right, you start to think about, well, how am I going to fund the plan? And that's really what we're, what's coming up for us when we're asking this revenue question. Because wouldn't it be great, even in typical times, to be able to say, well, these are the things I want to do and just go do them. But then the reality of limited resources and having to allocate our limited resources pops up. And that's why it's really hard to separate the revenue component and the expense component. And there's also this desire to kind of look at it all at once. So what we're gonna see, and yeah, we're gonna walk through this a little bit in uh, when we walk through step two is, well, how do I first think about what my viable options are? It's gonna be a little bit informed by your external environment. It then will be both limited and informed by resources you have available. So in terms of the shifts in what is possible today in terms of revenue, lots of us are faced with things like, I used to be able to rely on a special event and now I can't have that special event. So this is gonna be part of this taking stock of where we are and what's available, it will inform the viable options in our scenarios. So we're going to see that um, to Radhika's point when we look at establishing our scenario assumptions in our second step here. But that's a, I'm sure this is this is why we're here. This is what everyone is um, dealing with is this changing. It's different. It's both different and changing all the time. Um, we have a question about board designated funds. Can the board specifically designate some cash net assets to close a budget income gap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like the question is around board designating dollars to be used to fund a deficit, right? Or to close a deficit. So, the board can only, you know, by way of background, the board can only designate or earmark or direct unrestricted or net assets cash without donor restrictions, right? So that being said, this, these are dollars that are free and clear. If the board decides to designate to close a budget deficit or to designate for any other purpose, it's at the board's discretion. So the answer is yes. The board could say, these are dollars set aside. We're going to use, you know, we will release these dollars. We will allow them to be utilized to close a budget deficit or to fund a deficit or have us come to zero, cover a shortfall. So totally the board could do that. And the key is the board could also redirect and do something else with it. So just remember, there's flexibility in those dollars to the extent that the board is willing to direct or redirect. Yep, but yes, totally the board could designate for that purpose. Um, and then we have one more question uh, related to the budget process or the budget plan. So should organizations 
should annual budgets be changed due to a changing environment? If so, how often? Or should they be kept the same and used in conjunction with a scenario analysis? Yep. So, um, and I also want to acknowledge that was a question um, that it was an, uh, we'd say, a question that was um, submitted early at time of webinar registration. And I want to acknowledge Radhika has sent me that question already. I have that in a later uh, question break. So I was uh, planning to chat about that in terms of should we change budgets as we go along when things are changing, uh, when we talk about monitoring. So when we talk about monitoring with our reality as compared to our plan. So um, thanks for writing that in. We've got that kind of teed up um, in a moment. So we'll definitely get to that. Great, but I think we're all set to keep moving. Great, thanks Radhika. So keep um, noting questions as they come up and um, we've got another couple of question breaks as well. So happy to continue to uh, have the questions come in. It's always great to hear what's on your mind. It also helps us to really direct our time uh, to where folks need it to be. So thanks for that. So now let's look at step two in the three step scenario planning process. So we said we're gonna spend lots of time here in this step two. And this is the stage where our planning gets pretty different. Most of our work happens in this stage. And this is where we start to build our models and models with an S, right? Which of course is one of the ways where the planning is pretty different. And we're gonna think about, well, how do I even start to define my viable options? What are some scenario assumptions here? This is where we narrow down the world of possibilities. It's been several months now where lots of us are trying to figure out what to do in the upcoming months. There's lots of information coming at us. So in this step here, establishing scenario assumptions, is where we're going to try and kind of call through all of this information and figure out what are our viable options. Really, where are we going directionally? Then finally, we're going to get to gather some of this financial data, run the numbers, right? So this is where, again, for the participant who wrote in, things are changing. Our revenue is different now. This is where we'll get that information incorporated. Right? So this is where we'll start to reality test as well, some of these assumptions. Then of course, we're going to be able to select a course of action. After then we select our course of action, we're going to move forward with the plan, we will implement, and then we'll be later on in that managing cash flow or monitoring stage. But not surprising, uh, just like how we outlined for all of our financial planning, we really want to get going with defining our team. So who is on our team around scenario planning? Once we establish that team, we're going to set meeting agendas. We're going to establish a way of working together with our scenario planning team, acknowledging that we're going to have to do this more than once. We're going to have to come together with our team every time we need to redo the plan. When we're monitoring and when we have to calibrate, recalibrate. So do you have a cross-functional team? So again, just as we have lots of folks with us this morning, we want to make sure we have leadership represented, but cross-functionally. So executive director, CEO, an individual representing finance, program. We may not have in our organization an HR department. We likely don't. We may not even have a person uh, whose title has anything to do with HR right? um, or talent. But 
in the in this team around scenario planning, just as in our team around regular budgeting, we kind of need that market intelligence. So especially now when lots of us are making decisions around workforce, it's more important than ever to kind of have that expertise on our team. So how are we going to have that expertise and knowledge represented in our scenario planning team? What about the governing body? So what about some representation? Is it treasurer? Is it board chair? Is it someone completely different who participates in whatever way makes sense for your organization around scenario planning? And of course, what other outside expertise do we need in this moment, right? We've talked about the HR lens, but are there other potential uh, areas where we need outside expertise to help us figure out the way forward, right? I was working with an organization, for instance, and they're not going to be able to occupy their space anymore. One important decision was around, you know, can I get out of my lease if I want to get out of my lease? There are legal impl implications. So they needed to bring in an expert in real estate law, right? Letting them know, well, if this is your course of action, right? these are the rules, this might be the financial implication, things of that nature. So this is what we're talking about in terms of who do we need on this team um, or what information do we need from those folks. But in our first scenario planning team meeting, our conversations might start to look a little bit more like risk assessment than financial planning. We're looking externally. We're identifying things like external opportunities, right? What's necessary in my community right now, maybe, right? And how does it align with services that I provide? We may be looking at threats to our activities or threats to our funding, right? And again, this looks a lot more like risk assessment than it does to budgeting and planning. But this is what we want to start to identify with our scenario planning team and document this context. We want to articulate in words um, our situation. And just a reminder, we always need the words and not just the numbers to document the context for any of our financial plans. We also need to know what is possible for us. What are our capabilities as an organization right now? What are we good at? What are we poised to do? So we do want to agree, you know, in this scenario planning team on what are our organizational strengths and weaknesses, right? So see how this is starting to look a little like a SWOT analysis or a risk assessment, you know, from a programmatic perspective, also from a financial perspective. Understand our business model drivers. So again, this points to that question that was, that came through the Q&A around the revenue and how it's changing. So before, so before we begin to modeling scenarios, we're documenting all that. We're documenting where we are in terms of our resources available. We looked at our balance sheet. We're now documenting all of this other context. It's critically important because again, right now we already see that we have narrowed down some of our options here by doing this. Right, so we're figuring out not only what do we have to deal with externally, what's our context and what are we good at internally, what is possible, we're going to start to see where there is alignment. It's also about making informed decisions, in particular during this rapid response moment. So we're not foregoing all of these good practices using data, things of that nature. We then want to, after we've documented our context, think about the fact that, well, in step one, we asked ourselves some critical questions about our financial position. We're now gonna ask ourselves critical questions about the nature of our activities in order to establish our assumptions. It's also, helpful to frame our scenario planning questions in terms of these three large drivers. 
So we're gonna ask questions around programs. And here it indicates, well, what will be the impact in our programs? But really what we're asking is, will there be changes to our services? Now, some of us, we're gonna see in a moment, we may have increased need for our services. We may have stable demand. We may have demand, but not ability to deliver. So we wanna frame decisions around programming and what we're seeing is possible in that realm. We then want to also think about the lens of workforce and what will be the impact not only in our workforce in terms of programming staff, but what about our infrastructure? We then will look through this third lens in terms of, well, what about my overall finances? This also may include decisions around your reserves, your board designated funds, things of that nature. So think about the fact that what we decide to include or not in a scenario at this moment in time is an expression of your organization's values in this moment. Right? So if I'm able to be responsive to a need in the community and it makes sense based on my program, it makes sense and it makes sense based on my workforce, it makes sense based on the impact to my overall financial health, Right, so I looked at a scenario, I looked at an option and I ran it through each of these lenses and it all seems to make sense. It's also going to be more important than ever right now that we recognize it really expresses where your organization's values are because this in this moment of limited resources is where I'm deciding to invest. Right, and it kind of speaks externally to folks and also internally to folks. Now in particular around, you know, if we were kind of trying to play this out and look and see if I were to build a scenario, what might these critical questions look like for me? Well, if I'm trying to decide on a broad direction, because right now I'm not really sure the way to go and I'm not really sure what my scenarios might look like, let's start to narrow down our viable options and let's start with you know, if we were to do this for our organization, let's start with thinking about programs. And maybe if I'm looking at these critical questions for my organization, I'm starting with programs, I likely have some gut feeling as to where we're going directionally. The questions in the program area might look like this. Will we have any of our activities pause or stop? Right, you're able to answer this question likely. So is there something around either the environment not allowing us to continue providing services? Is it just for a short period of time, right? So now we're thinking about that duration or is it unclear if I need to pause activities when they will pick up again? On the flip side, are there any activities that we may have to increase? Is there something new that is necessary that we're going to be able to provide? Are we going to keep providing the same kinds of activities, but change the way we deliver our services? So is it same service, different delivery? And then let's not forget this overall lens of after I've kind of looked at the programming and looked at our activities, which of these is core to our mission and I really need to try to maintain no matter what. So again, that expression of values, uh, what's core and central to what we do that we really wanna try and figure out how to keep doing. This will help us set our general direction. This helps us to narrow down the options that right now, again, seems like there's lots of information and lots of options possible. So once we're able to set our general direction, we're able to then think a little bit deeper about that general direction and think about things like time horizon and things of that nature. So let's just assume 
in kind of thinking about our programming, perhaps we fall under the realm of having to pause or stop our activity. So maybe that's going to be my general scenario direction. I have to pause, I have to stop. If we move forward with that, if we were to create a, a scenario plan, we then would take that general direction that we've identified and start to think about, well, what do the scenarios look like in that general direction? So we've already narrowed, right? We've already chosen a path. We're gonna narrow down that broad scenario and we're actually now gonna think about a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, and something in the middle. But they all directionally point to a decrease or a pause of your activity. So it's three scenarios, but they all directionally are the same. So that's what we also wanna talk about. When we build scenarios, it's typically not, you know, this is the scenario for increased activity, and this is the scenario for stopping, and this is the scenario for staying the same. What we're saying is the three models we build are all directionally the same, but in varying degrees. So this is really an important concept here. So when we think about, well, in that general direction of pausing or stopping our activities, if we have best, worst, and somewhere in the middle, there's something around time horizon to consider. Right? So when will these changes take effect? Will it be immediate? Will, do I have a little bit of time or runway? How long will it look like this? So how long will these changes stay in place? In other words, when can I start up again? <laughs> and of course, we'd all like to know the answer to that. So there's something around, you know, is it immediate and temporary? Is it immediate and permanent? Right, so those are two scenarios that again, directionally are the same, but one sounds like best and one sounds like worst. Or do we just not know? And a lot of us today are in that I just don't know moment. And this is valid. And so we want to acknowledge that maybe we don't know. Your scenarios might look like this. In the best case scenario, or maybe we can say, you know, this is the most innovative scenario. If I'm running, say, an after school program, and I've directionally decided that we've got to pause activities of course because schools are closed, maybe in my best case scenario, I'm gonna be able to run some programming in the summer of 2020, and in my best case scenario, schools reopen in the fall, and my in-person programming will begin. And so this is best case scenario, but again, directionally the same as my other scenarios here that I'm building up. Directionally the same and that I've had to pause or stop my activities. Maybe in my most likely or moderate or middle of the road scenario, I cannot run any programming for this summer. I'm gonna resume my summer programming next year, 2021. School districts will open in the fall and I think I'll still be able to resume some fall programming. So this is my moderate scenario. So summer went away, but fall stayed. And then in my, you know, it's not so pleasant to say worst case scenario, maybe it's my plan B. Sounds like a nicer way to say my least desirable scenario. You know, might look something like, we've got to cancel summer 2020, we know that we may want to resume in summer 2021, even in my worst case scenario, that's possible. But schools are not gonna open in the fall in the way that allows me to facilitate my after school programming. Schools are gonna open in the winter of 21. We might have to explore moving fall to virtual. So to take a step back now and think about the fact that we now have three scenarios that are all directionally the same. We've chosen a path here based on conversation, based on our external scan of our environment. 
what's happening out there, what are the risks, what's possible for my organization, what does my programming look like. We talk to our team. We have some assumptions here around what we're able to uh, provide and not. Are we able to provide virtual? Is there demand for that, right? So we ask lots of critical questions around programming we then thought about, we're gonna think about as well, kind of behind the scenes here, what does that mean for our workforce? Major implications, of course, for our workforce in each of these scenarios, for our staff. So likely when you're building out your scenarios, you would have more boxes here. It would say something like, you know, in the worst case or plan B, we would want to touch upon not only the programming lens, right, but remember the three drivers. Also, what, what does this mean for our workforce? And what about our overall financial resources? Will I have to, will I decide to keep folks employed? If so, do I have reserves to cover payroll, right? So think about the programming, the workforce, and then your overall financial resources. We're going to, in a moment, talk about how to then I think about the revenue. How, these are my activities. This is what I think is possible. This is what I want to move forward with. How then do I incorporate this element of revenue and funding for each of these scenarios? Right? We're also going to look at a tool to help us build some of that out. But we can see here that we did a lot of work to come up with some options for moving forward. So we'd like to take a little bit of time here and do something a little bit fun and different and kind of ask you all, if you had to put together some scenario, like these are hard decisions that some group of folks had to make in terms of defining these scenarios. So recognizing that is definitely challenging to come up with what these scenarios are. We'd like to take a moment uh, and do something a little bit fun and different um, and invite all of you to help us put together a word cloud this morning. Um, Want to ask you what is challenging for you all about even defining these scenarios? So is it scary? Right? Is it this element of the unknown? Is it being resource constrained? So what is challenging about getting to this point of defining scenarios? In order to do that, um, Radhika is going to help us out um, in a moment, but I'll just quickly run through the instructions here. Some of you have, might have participated in putting together these word clouds. So think about what's challenging and come up with a word. You can either look to the chat box and follow the link in your chat box to our word cloud and log in. Uh, you don't have to put your name or anything and type in a word, one word response, um, and let us know what is challenging about coming up with scenarios. Why does it seem hard sometimes? You can put in as many one word responses as you choose. We're gonna see in a moment where folks are responding. You also, um, on your phone, can text FMA1310, text to this number to 22333, after you do that, you'll get a quick little reply, and then you can just start texting your words, and they'll show up in our word cloud. So let us know if you have any questions, um, but give everyone a moment to, and I think everyone can see the word cloud right now, and we've got lots of things um, coming up, which is super exciting. So I think everyone can see the word cloud. I can see the word cloud. So we're seeing things like confidence, anxiety, imagination, exhausting, resource limited, dizzying, unknowns, time, variety, ambiguity, black swans, money, behavior, fluctuation, schools, volume, 
So please feel free uh, to keep noting things in the word cloud. Um, we like to do this because we certainly want to recognize, again, we've got a lot of internal and external, we'd say, pressures, complications, and we're certainly working through a scenario planning model right now, which can help us, but we can't ignore the fact that this is really hard. Right? And we may have to come together, and this is why it's also important to have our team to make some decisions that could be pretty challenging. Right? Someone just wrote in urgency, scare. So revenue, things of that nature. And of course, complexity, uh, ever-changing. Right? And of course, we could go on. And you can keep... Um, putting things in the word cloud and we'll keep letting it build as well. Um, but certainly we didn't want to ignore the fact that um, we're dealing with real life in each of those three areas of the drivers. So certainly in the programmatic area, our program participants and impact on those folks in our workforce decisions we make impacting our staff. And then of course, overall looking at organizational finances, when we think about the way we are deploying our resources or not in this moment, how does that affect my organization long term? And so we're really dealing with making pretty big decisions here and want to recognize that we also have all of this complication going on, right? So certainly we're in this moment. Thanks everybody uh, for participating in our word cloud. Um, and certainly we encourage you to keep going with it. It'll kind of be running in the background. Happy to take in this moment a little bit of break um, as well to see what kinds of questions um, are coming up for you all as we really looked at the first stage in identifying uh, our viable options, which really was centering around, you know, our scenario assumptions and starting to document a general direction, coming up with best, worst, and somewhere in the middle cases. Um, Veronica, what kinds of questions are coming through the Q&A for us? Yeah, so, this is a really interesting question uh, because it hits at the point of organizations that maybe have multiple programs and multiple activities. So the question is, you know, what are the, any issues with the current direction, including three of the possible broad options? Our organization is pausing some activities, initiating some new activities, and changing the delivery method of others. So would you propose developing best, worst, and moderate scenarios for each program before combining them organizational-wide scenario? Yep, that's a really, really great question. Um, and so just to recap, our example was, we'd say one, you know, involved one program being an after-school program. Well, what if I have after-school program, summer camp, daycare, um, and maybe I'm able to make different decisions and different general directions on each. So there also will be a moment that they're gonna kind of come together. So it seems to make sense that in our team meeting, in building our context and documenting where we're going, it seems to make sense that we're gonna look at all of our programs separately to some extent, if it's necessary, right? So some organizations, based on the nature of the activities we do, maybe all of these activities will directionally go in one place, right? It might be that the nature of our services or activities are, I don't wanna say similar, but they're all impacted in the same way. So if they're all impacted in the same way, you know, maybe we can kind of keep it all in one 
you know, best, worst, moderate sphere. If things are looking really different, right? If they're looking really different, so maybe it's um, my um, food, you know, providing food. So soup kitchen, maybe I used to only provide lunch and now I'm gonna provide dinner. So maybe it's increase in that activity, but a different activity, maybe it is meals in schools, that one will stop. So it might not be that I'm building out three scenarios for each, but maybe my best case scenario is something that incorporates all of my programs, right? So maybe my best case scenario is continue to provide lunch and dinner, curtail, stop um, for the foreseeable future, my um, school snack program, right? So we're gonna think about them all separately, but we can combine them then and come up with best, worst, and somewhere in the middle. Because ultimately, we're going to use those scenarios to actually build on our financial models. We're gonna price out each one. So even if you have to think about them separately, have them come together ultimately to have the three scenarios. Great. Um, and then there's a question on how do you overcome board and or staff resistance to planning? Ah, to planning. <laughs> So I wonder, and I'm just wondering, Radek and I just wondering, um, I wonder if there's been an aversion to wanting to participate in planning before, right? Or it might be good to know, is this just how it's always been, right? Planning is, yes, time consuming. We're seeing this a little bit tedious. We've got to talk about things that maybe are both not fun and also seem to include numbers, which isn't everybody's favorite thing. So is it kind of culturally, it's always challenging to have folks participate in planning? Or is it also in this moment, it's hard because who wants to talk about these hard decisions? I think it would be important to know which we're dealing with. It seems like that all, there may be something also around, again, letting folks know that their inclusion in this process, we wanna hear, we wanna hear everyone's voice in this process. And also it's about sharing information and being transparent and not having decisions have the appearance of being made, you know, either without information or behind closed doors or things of that nature. So it would be great if this message could start with the board um, but just the observation might be that it's exacerbated right now, but this might kind of have been a theme prior where folks didn't want to participate in planning or just sort of stick to all the positives around it. It's about transparency. Also let folks know this is not a one and done. We don't know the duration of what we're dealing with right now really we want their participation because we're going to have to do this more than once and the fact that we have to do it more than once really means we want to build a strong team around this so just let folks know that it's really about the future of the organization and building this efficient team around something that's going to be a repetitive process um i think we got a little bit of clarification that came in as well just on that question that you know, the organization culture is a bit more planning averse and it's become exacerbated now. And then there's also the question around how do you even make the time to plan when everyone is in the weeds, you have less staff, you can't meet in person with the board, and maybe you have a week for it. Right. So we want to think about a couple of things. I mean, one avenue might be, you know, looking at the size of your team around planning, right? So maybe this is a moment to start with really a, a smaller but core planning team, still making sure we have cross-functional representation, and then maybe building those norms around meeting, right? Starting out slower and then bringing other folks on later. It might also be helpful um, to share some of these tools that we're gonna show you all in a minute and things of that nature. 
as a way to let folks know we've already thought through the process right maybe letting folks know we know we want this to be efficient we've done some pre-thinking here so maybe it's a little bit of homework pre-thinking maybe sharing the tools in the process maybe letting you know we totally understand there's zoom fatigue there's virtual meeting fatigue there's also really important um, work happening maybe in different strange ways that we're having to navigate right now. So maybe a little bit of pre-thinking, sharing with folks the whole process so they kind of know, well, what am I in for? How long will this last? How many meetings will there be? And just defining it so there's clarity. Maybe that will help to kind of lessen this sort of, gosh, you know, how am I gonna do this too kind of moment. Radhika, do we have one more um, before we move on or no? Uh, no, I think we can keep going. All right, well, thank you for that. So definitely good questions. I'll also say that I'm pretty sure there's no question that someone's asking that, you know, is a question that others don't have as well. So certainly these are really common items that we're all dealing with, um, not only now, uh, but pretty frequently just around planning in general. So we really appreciate that. But we did a lot of work setting our context. We then have these broad scenarios we identified. We now have a path to model. So I know we're still in step two, we're still building our scenarios, but now we can start running the numbers. So of course, we talked about that all scenario planning starts with our baseline. Where are we now? We finally can gather some different kind of key data in order to cost out our different plans. We know where to find that info. Right? So we know we're gonna look at maybe a little bit of historical data if we're going to be able to provide services in the same way so maybe we look at our current year budget, right? What did we think it was gonna to cost to do this thing if it's the same thing? If we're going to provide services in a different way, well, then we might have to go get outside information. If we're doing something differently than we ever did before, right? This will be new gathering of information as to well, what will it take? It's also gonna be important, and we've said this several times, to think about our timeline and duration. We need to incorporate this in the models. So in our scenarios, we said something like, you know, this will happen in the summer, this will happen in fall 2020 or winter 21. So we need to know duration here because they will be an impact on our cost. So we have to identify the timeline and then what are our um, any alternatives as well. But as nonprofits, we're really accustomed to creating budgets all the time. Right? So this is not the first time that any of us have put together a budget. We do it all the time for our um, grant applications, things of that nature. Nonprofits are really good at budgeting. <laughs> so once we have the plan, we're gonna price out the plan. We're going to build these three financial models. But as we said earlier, once we build out the model, it's really hard not to think about immediately how are we going to fund this plan. So then we start to think about those resource scenarios that we talked about. We know what it will cost. Wouldn't it be great to then just go and enact the plan, implement it? We may have to take a step back. Do we have resources to fund these plans? So again, a little bit more of a risk assessment lens here when we think about funding our plans. So perhaps we think about each of our revenue sources, analyze each of our different revenue sources individually for risk. What is in jeopardy? Is it my earned revenue stream? Many of us have our special event revenue in jeopardy. Is it individual contributions or on the flip side, are there opportunities in the realm of individual contributions? So it's a little bit of an external scan for each of our revenue sources in our business model. 
So it's really what is our business model been? If it's government contracts, are we able to deliver? If it's investment income, what's happening with the market? Did I take advantage of in-kind donations in the past? If so, is that still possible now? Maybe it's an opportunity, maybe in-kind is a new and different way that I can fund some of these plans. Right, so we really have to think about each component of revenue in our business model. This is a moment for some organizations as well that maybe your business model is changing. And so again, maybe if I was dependent on or earned a revenue stream that is not possible, how am I shifting, right? What is that shift in the way I fund the plan? And then what resources do we have, right? This really ties back to our baseline conversation again. Is it looking to existing reserves to fund some of our plan? Is it financing, right? So not philanthropic revenue or not my own revenue stream, but maybe it's financing and borrowing money, things of that nature. Is it asking funders to redirect restricted dollars? Do I have a new opportunity now based on a new activity I'm conducting? So do I have a new potential funding stream based on the way I've changed my delivery? So we really want to think about one by one each component of our revenue in our business model that exists and then any new opportunities for revenue that might be different. So then we've come up with our plan. We've got three potential options that are all directionally the same and also acknowledging that if we've got multiple programs, they're all directionally the same for that program. They may be different from each other, right? One program might be different than another. So we see why some folks put complex or complicated in the word cloud, right? Then we priced out the plan. Now we're looking at revenue. So I wanna share with all of you a tool that we could use to document what we're talking about here. <laughs> Actually document the financial model. Acknowledging that these scenario models are not as detailed as your one year annual budget, right? So the fact that we have to build three of them, we have to see if they're viable. Are they viable options? Do I have resources to cover the expenses for each of these options. In broad strokes, high level, what does it look like? And knowing that, not only do I have to do this three times, when it changes, when reality is happening different than I thought, which right now, again, change of environment, this is going to keep happening, this needs to be easy to modify and update. So to the point that someone raised around aversion to wanting to do this, if this was super cumbersome, none of us would want to do it. So I um, want to share with you all something that's available um, for free on strongnonprofits.org, which will all have access to this link to that website. Um, you don't have to rush and copy it down. It's, um, I know it's called Revenue Scenario Planning Tool, but it also has expenses incorporated as well for three scenarios. So see here we see our best case, our worst case, and our moderate case scenario. Just wanna pop into it quickly here. I know the text is small. We do not have to read the text together, but I wanted to just visually show you the tool for a minute, um, just to let you know that there is a tab in this Excel workbook with instructions. So really helpful in that um, it's going to guide you as to how to populate this tool and use the worksheet. There's also a third tab with a completed example. So we can kind of see, well, when I'm all done, what might this look like? And then of course, um, your worksheet in the middle that you could use to populate three scenarios, which includes Revenue and expenses, I'll go to the completed example here. We've got a pre-kindergarten program, an after-school program. So a couple of programs here with um, revenues and high-level expenses um, for each. Really to look at, again, broad strokes, what is the viability um, of each of these options?
Okay. So um, that being said, we can see how this is at a different level than our one year annual budget. And perhaps this is the way in letting folks know that we can all participate in this, right? It's high level enough for us to kind of price out our options here and see what's possible and really have good conversations about it, right? So letting folks know, maybe looking at this tool as to well, what are you in for when you sign up to participate in our scenario planning. I wanna also come back to our three scenarios and also point out the fact that we've got some new boxes down at the bottom in each of our scenarios here. So what we've done in this stage is we've added revenue to the mix. So remember our best case scenario, school districts opening in the fall, we're running full season of programming. And by the way, after we consider the revenue, our individual contributions will remain at historical levels. So I'm adding, I'm adding assumptions to my scenarios as I go, right? So remember, we just had really simple scenarios with a couple of assumptions. You're gonna have all different kinds of assumptions in your scenarios. Certainly the revenue assumption is an important component, right? And so in our moderate case, our individual contributions have declined. And in my worst case, they've declined even more, right? So again, we're building layers of different attributes. So then after I've priced all of this out, my team has to come together and select a course of action. And selecting this course of action um, is our final component really in our step two and identifying implications, building the scenarios, and then moving forward with a course of action. So again, it's really critical that we have a team come together to do this, right? To select the course of action, after that, after we've implemented and we're on our path, it's going to be really important for us to monitor. And typically in these times, our monitoring takes the form of looking at cash. So we're typically managing our cash really closely during these times. Maybe even if we didn't historically monitor cash that closely, it's more important right now. But We've really come full circle though, to starting with developing this team, putting our team together around planning. We worked with our team through this whole process. Now our team is coming together to determine the best strategy. To think about defining, well, what are the milestones here? What are the critical checkpoints, not only for us internally so that we know um, you know, how do we know if we're on the right path or on a different path? What will be the indicators that signal us needing to recalibrate? What's going to be the communication in my organization with the governing body, maybe with external folks, right? And what are going to be the roles and responsibilities around that communication, right? So we're really coming full circle with our team here knowing that lots of folks need to be engaged, not only in the creation of the plan, but in the monitoring and in the communication. And then finally, when we are monitoring and managing our cash flow, the message is we want to monitor this as closely as necessary. So some folks say, well, should I do monthly cash flow? Should I do weekly? You do it as close, you do it as detailed as necessary um, for the moment you're in. Right? So if it's really hard to pay the bills on a week to week basis, then you need to do a weekly cash flow. If it's enough to do a monthly cash flow, then that's great, but this may change over time depending on our situation. Remember, if we're gonna consider financing, it's about timing. So financing should help us to cover um, delayed cash receipts to manage timing of cash flow. Financing really is not meant to cover a structural deficit. So financing isn't meant to cover and pay for a plan that just isn't possible, right? Because then of course we have to repay the financing. For financing as well. So I know we've only got a minute or so. I'm just looking to see um, before we 
wrap up. Um, if there are any final questions coming through, I think we might have time for a question. Um, I actually think this question will probably fit nicely into the resources. Um, it's a question from the, or for organizations that maybe don't have the expertise to do the planning, may need outside help, but can't and are, aren't able to spend money to do the planning. Um, what should those organizations do? Yep, so um, I would say, you know, first try and come together, see who else could be on your team, right? So I've seen this in some moments where, you know, say in more typical times, we're embarking on some special project. And maybe we don't have expertise on our board for this project, and maybe our staff don't have expertise. Is there a volunteer in our community, right, who's able to, you know, be on a special committee, if you will, and volunteer to help us? Right? And we do this all the time when we run special events, things of that nature. We bring others together who have expertise in doing these things. So, you know, reach out to local funders to see if they have a network. Um, of folks who are able to volunteer in this way. Um, and otherwise, getting help in this moment, um, even in something that seems super technical, uh, could be possible. So I would really first try that avenue. Um, and then before we wrap up and I let you know of some other resources available, um, also wanted to not forget that early question that came in that was around uh, monitoring, right? So we just said we're going to monitor our plan. We're going to monitor cash flow. Question came in saying, should we be changing the budget right, when things change during the year? So just wanted to, this is, and this is a, this is a concept that's not just for scenario planning. It's a concept that's valid forever in that your budget is what you wanted to achieve. It was your plan. Your forecast is your prediction today of the future based on new information and based on new reality. So typically we recommend revising your future forecast as often as necessary, but not really revising your budget, right? And you know everything it took to go into the budget and your budget was your plan, but now your plans have changed and you can re-forecast all the time and help you to evidence what you think the future will be. So we recommend using a forecast um, and updating that as opposed to continuously updating your budget. So we know we're two minutes past, um, but we want to um, remind you, as Mayor mentioned, um, you'll all receive an email with a survey, a link within. So please, um, we all really appreciate you responding to the survey. And when you receive uh, materials as a follow-up, um, also know there are a host of um, different links and articles, including the link um, to Strong Nonprofits, um, where you can find uh, not only that um, revenue scenario planning tool, uh, but cash flow planning tool as well and other, you know, a whole host of other free resources um, that you can access not only now, but any moment in time um, for any kind of financial management project you might have. Also, we are happy to share our contact information and would love to hear uh, from any of you um, at any point in time and see um, if we can kind of keep our dialogue going and be of help in any way. So really want to thank everyone for being with us uh, this morning. Hope you found it helpful um, and hope to, you know, see you in this virtual way again. So thanks everybody.